Go to Genesis chapter 22, first book in our Bible. We'll be turning to quite a few passages this morning. And by no means will I exhaust this subject of learning from sickness and suffering when God, when that is brought into our life. But there are some biblical truths that we need to get a hold of from God's word. That way, as God's people, we deal with reality from God's point of view instead of society's point of view or the point of view of the news and media. We want to handle life from the lenses of the Word of God and see life correctly from God's point of view. So we begin in Genesis chapter 22. Let's go ahead and stand together as we read God's Word. <coughs> Remember that God has, in the book of Genesis, been dealing with all the nations of the world from creation, Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 11. And then at the end of chapter 11, on forward, God chooses a man by the name of Abram, who later on God would change his name to Abraham. God would elect him, would choose him. He would come to faith in the Lord. And God promised that through Abraham and through his descendant, all the nations, all the ethnic groups of the world would be blessed with salvation. And that ultimate descendant is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. But here... God has given uh, Abraham, of course, a son, a, the son of promise, Isaac, in which God will fulfill all of his covenant promises. But God asked him to do something very radical, and that is to take his son on Mount Moriah and to kill him as a sacrifice unto God. Genesis 22 and verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt or test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for a burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they both and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place of which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast with, not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead or in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, and the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Before we pray, I just wanted to, to thank everybody for their love and the concern. There are many uh, encouraging notes that you wrote and text to us while we were sick in the last couple of weeks. And thank you for the delicious food also that you purchased for us. That was a big help and a blessing to our family. We love you and we're so grateful for you. Uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your precious word. Thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It is your word which is our all-sufficient guide for life and for death. Help us, Lord, to look at life through the lenses of your word, to realize even in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trials, in the midst of sickness, you have something for us to learn. And your word reveals some of those things to us. Help us as your people that we would grasp the truths of your word, 
Father, we may not be in a trial, but if we're not in one now, we will be one in the future. So, Lord, prepare our hearts even now. As we have health to come to church, we have strength to sing praises to you. We have the ability to stand in church. Lord, we may not always have that. So, Lord, give us your divine perspective. Help us that according to Romans 12, that we would not be conformed to this world system, but that we would be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Renew our mind through the truth of your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> when I think of the issues of sickness, suffering, great trials, there is one specifically that stands out in my mind as we approach September 11th. We remember September 2001, I don't know where you were at, but I was uh, that day actually hurt my back the day before, so I was in bed not going to work that morning when the alarm went on and told us these words, America under attack. And my eyes woke up, I, I just, my eyes opened widely like, under attack? What does he mean? And began to announce what was going on. I got up, walked to the television, my waist was killing me, turned on the TV, and, of course, on every channel, the events of 9-11 were live. 2,996 people, people that day went to work and did not come home. They entered eternity. They did not plan that. They took all the security precautions. I'm sure they wore their seatbelts going driving to work. They did not think that they would die that day, and yet they did. I seen, remember watching on live TV many people dying right in front of me. When I think of that tragedy, uh, the I, people began to, news channels, the days following, began to interview different pastors, religious leaders, rabbis, imams, etc. And they would ask the question, why did that horrible thing happen? Without exception, the majority of them, not all of them, there are a few faithful men, the majority of them quickly said God had nothing to do with it. He didn't want it to happen, but it happened anyways. It was not his fault. God tried to do all that he could to stop it, but it, it just didn't. I remember one specific preacher on television who preaches with better, better rhythm than I do got up and he made it very clear that it was not God's fault. It was the devil. The devil did this. And I don't doubt, by the way, that the devil was involved. But just remember Job chapter 1. The devil could not do anything without God's permission. So even when the devil's active, and his demons certainly are, and false religion is demonic. The devil's on a leash, and God holds that leash. <clears throat> it was mere chance, they were saying, a random happening that brought such devastation to our country. In the early 1970s, Don McLean wrote a song called American Pie. The song was, the lyrics were about the tragic deaths of these young rock stars, uh, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and others that died in the 1950s in a, tragically in a plane crash. At one point in the song, McLean describes God's role in that calamity of young people dying tragically. He wrote, three men... I admire most the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They caught the last train to the coast the day the music died. What was he trying to say? He was trying to say when young people died like Richie Valens and they died tragically, God had nothing to do with it. He was on vacation on the coast, maybe at Pismo, maybe at Moral, I don't know. But that he was gone, God was helpless to stop that tragedy. Is it a true understanding of how the universe runs? Does it actually and properly portray the roles of God, of chaos, and of man in these song lyrics? For the Christian, there's only one way to gauge the truthfulness of such ideas, and it is to ask the question, what saith the scriptures? What does the word of God say? Not to the changing news people, not to the changing 
organizations of our government. But what does the Bible say? At the very heart and foundation of God's word is the truth, the glorious doctrine of the sovereignty of God, that God is large and he is in charge. What that means is that God is the creator of the universe. <clears throat> he is Lord and master. He is maintaining the creation. He is directing it and working all things out according to his will. The Bible depicts that everything that happens in heaven on earth is because God decreed it, he purposed it, and he willed it. What does this mean when we speak of the sovereignty of God? Well, it means this by way of introduction. The sovereignty of God demands that God be viewed as the creator, ruler, and owner of the universe. That these are kind of hard truths, true, because if you listen to Christian radio, you think God's your boyfriend, the way he's described in modern-day contemporary Christian music. But God demands to be viewed as the creator, the ruler, and the owner of everything. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. God owns the body of the governor. The President Biden will give an account to Almighty God. He will bow the knee to God. He is Lord over all people. The earth is the Lord's. Psalm 103, verse 19. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Before the entire assembly of Israel, David praised God with these words in 1 Chronicles 29, verses 10 and 11. Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. God's sovereignty <clears throat> is also the exercise of his power and superiority. The way God exercises his awesome power Arthur W. Pink, a man who's now with the Lord, wrote, The sovereignty of God may de be defined as the exercise of his supremacy. God does as he pleases, only as he pleases, and always as he pleases. Divine sovereignty means that God is in fact, as well as in name, that he is on the throne of the universe, directing all things, working all things, quote, after the counsel of his own will, Ephesians 1, 11. Psalm 135, verse 6, reminds us of this truth. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that he did in heaven and in earth and in the seas and in all deep places. Isaiah 46, where God is being contrasted between the false gods of people and the one true God. Isaiah 46, verse 9 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my good pleasure. God says the one of the distinctives between him, Jehovah, and the false gods of people, including Buddha, is this. God not only knows the future, predicts the future, but he controls the future. That's the difference. The sovereignty of God means also. <clears throat> sovereignty means that God controls and directs all the deeds of men. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart deviseth his way. You plan your steps. I'm going to do this. I'm going to work till I'm 65. I'm going to retire. I'm going to buy a beach house. I'm going to live there till I'm 85. Then when I'm 95, I'm going to move and live here. And then when I get 100, I'm going to... You can devise all the plans. And certainly it's not wrong to plan. It's wise to plan. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord, Jehovah, directs his steps. In 1558... 
when Bonar, the Bishop of London, had secured a warrant for the arrest of this faithful preacher by the name of Bernard Gilpin. He was arrested for preaching that a man is not saved by the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. A man is saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Salvation is not handed out peace and meal through sacraments. It is given to the guilty sinner who will believe savingly on the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that, Pastor Bernard Gilpin was going to be taken from his town to London to be executed. And as he was arrested, <clears throat> the men who arrested him were mocking him. You always talk about the sovereignty of God, how all things work together for your good. I mean, where is God's sovereignty now? They were mocking his view that God's in control. How God's in control, we're going to burn you tomorrow. And as he's being taken, he fell off the cart and he broke his leg. He went from bad to worse. And as his leg broke, they said to him, what is this that nothing happens unless God intends? It was God in control when you broke your leg, they told the preacher. The preacher said, yeah, God's in control of everything. Ah, look at you with the broken leg. Where's this view of God is in control? And they mocked him as they're taking him to London to be executed by Queen Mary Tudor, known as Bloody Mary, the most vicious of persecutors of Protestant believers. Because of his broken leg, his trip to London was delayed by one day. The day he arrived in London for his execution, Queen Mary died the day before. God was in control. Even when your leg is broken, even when you're sick, God is on the throne. He's not shocked. God does not watch CNN and say, oh, no, oh, my. Everything's out of control. We better listen to the next expert, even though he contradicted the expert a year earlier. But what are we going to do? Proverbs 20, verse 24, man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man understand his way? Psalm 33, verse 10, the Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. Ask Nebuchadnezzar if God's in control. Nebuchadnezzar at first would have told you in Daniel 4, I'm in control. I'm the man. Look at, isn't this great kingdom that I have built? Look at the buildings. Literally, millions of bricks in Babylon. All of them said, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Man, he wanted everyone to know he was the king. He was the ruler. And yet in his pride, God takes his mind away. He goes crazy for seven years. He runs naked into the woods and lives like an animal. At the end of that, God restores his mind and brings him to faith in Jehovah God. And in Daniel 4, 34, he says, At the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I bless the Most High, and I praise and honored him that liveth forever and ever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, whose kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none, none can stay his hand or say unto him, What are you doing? What do you mean, what are you doing? He's God. He's in charge. And Nebuchadnezzar learned that by the grace of God. Sovereignty, by way of introduction, sovereignty means that God controls and directs the ways of the animal kingdom. Even Fido is not out of God's control, believe it or not. Psalm 50, verse 10, God says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls, the birds of the mountains, and the wild of beasts of the field are mine, God says. Psalm 104, verse 27. Speaking of the animals, these all wait upon thee, that thou mayest give them their food in their due season. That thou givest them, they gather. Thou openest thy hand, and they are filled with good. God's in charge of the animals. He even makes sure they get fed. God's sovereignty means... That God controls and directs nature. There is no mother nature. There's only a sovereign father God. Amen. Psalm 74, verse 16. The day is thine. 
The night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made the summer and the winter. He's made the hurricanes, the tornadoes, and yea, even the earthquakes. They're under God's control. This is in the Psalms, like we learned on Wednesday night, constantly says that Jehovah controls the waves. He controls the winds and the waves on the sea. So when Jesus shows up in Luke chapter 8, and in the midst of the storm, he stands up in the boat and he says, Peace, be still. And immediately the winds, whoosh, they shut down. The waves immediately go as flat and the sea becomes flat as glass. Jesus showed he is sovereign over nature because Jesus is the divine son of God. This is why God could make the sun stand still in Joshua 10. He's in charge. By way of introduction, I know it's a long introduction, but bear with me. It's been four weeks since I've preached. <laughs> Sovereignty means that God controls and directs the supernatural. Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening, listening unto the voice of his word. Angelic beings, whether they be elect angels, holy angels, or fallen angels, which are demons, when they ceased to be holy angels and rebelled with Satan, they did not lose their fantastic powers. They still have them. <clears throat> but God's in charge. In Job chapter 1, we, we see that, don't we? The devil goes up before God and says, look at, God tells Job, or God tells Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He's an upright man who eschews evil. He does good. He's, he's a God-fearing man. And Satan says, well, the only reason he fears you is because all that you have given him. And <clears throat> there's this hedge of protection around him. Listen, the devil, want, he was like a, <clears throat> a pet bull with saliva coming down his cheeks. He was just biting at the bit, ready to get at Job. But he couldn't until God allowed it. He had to get God's permission to touch him. So God is in control of Satan. God and Satan, it's not like an equal match of two MMA fighters fighting in a cage, God against the devil. God is creator, sovereign over all, including angels, good and evil, including Satan. Even the devil is subject to the sovereign hand of God. The Bible flatly contradicts the view of many today that adversity, sickness, trials come from the devil and God has nothing to do with them. In fact, to claim that suffering happens by chance is to deny the very truth of the sovereignty of God. <clears throat> that person that person might as well, that they believe in, might as well be Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. After all, Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy can shower down blessings, but they can't control tragedies. But God is not Santa Claus, and he's not the Tooth Fairy. He is Jehovah God who is in charge. Charles Spurgeon, the Baptist preacher of old, explains it in a very powerful way. Listen. Men will allow God to be everywhere except on his throne. They will allow him to be in his workshop to fashion the worlds and make the stars. They will allow him to be in his almary to dispense alms and bounties. They will allow him to sustain the earth and to bear up the pillars thereof or to light the lamps of heaven or to rule the waves of ever-moving ocean. But, but when God ascends to his throne, his creatures gnash with their teeth. And we proclaimed an enthroned God and his right to do as he wills with his own, to dispose of his creatures as he thinks well without consulting them in the matter. Then, then it is that men turn a deaf ear to us. For God on his throne is not the God they love, but it is the God upon the throne that we love to preach it is God upon the throne that we can trust in even when we're sick, 
Even when we don't know the outcome of our sickness, we still know, the Christian still knows that God is in charge. It is because God is sovereign that Romans 8.28 is a precious promise to believers. And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to His purpose. So what do we learn? Well, there's many lessons. We'll see how many we get through. When suffering comes, when sickness comes, when trials come, it will test the strength of our faith. It's one thing to say, I believe God when things are going good. It's another thing to say, I believe God when things are going terrible. Here in Genesis 22, we find the classic example of this tremendous test that brought anguish to the heart of Abraham. This test that he had to give up his own son. It was the severest trial any father could face to give his own son. I think about it because I have one son. Ed has only one son. <laughs> that, 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 that punctures the heart. Severe test. Genesis 22 verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that God did test or tempt Abraham. And said to him, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon the mountains which I tell thee of. That must have stunned Abraham. Abraham, Abraham, take your son. Isaac, your only son of promise. Yeah, yeah, the one that you really, really love. God's rubbing it in. The one you really love. Take him. Take him to this mountain range, Mount Moriah. And have him sacrifice there to me. What, what went on Abraham's mind? Why would God ask for a human sacrifice when we as his people are to live different than the pagans around me, the Canaanites? They kill their children to their demon gods. We don't. This doesn't make sense. Why would you go to such lengths, almighty God, to give a hundred-year-old man a boy and then to take him? And not only to, God's not saying your son's going to die. No, no, no. Your son's going to die, and you are going to do the killing. This is stunning to him. How is it that he is the son of promise? He is the one that ultimately, through his lineage, the Messiah, the Savior of the world will come. How can the Savior of the world come if my one son's going to be killed today? The whole idea was absolutely inconceivable to Abraham. It was a trial that made no sense, and some trials may not make sense. In addition to these factors, this trial is perhaps the most severe because it's not just his son is going to die, but you, Abraham, will do the killing. Verse 3, we see how he reacts. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. Notice that he got up early in the morning. He said, well, God told me to do it. Oh, but he didn't tell me the time to do it. I'm going to wait to, to Isaac's 85, and then I'll offer him there. Yeah, technically God didn't say it. Maybe there's a, he's going to you know, be like a good lawyer. He's going to find a hole to go through there. He doesn't do that. He knew what God meant. Now, he wakes up extra early, prepares his donkey, takes the wood, and off he goes to do the will of God, though it didn't make sense to him. Verse 4, Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. He's not lying. You know what he's saying? Stay here at the mountain, servants. Guard my donkey. My son and I are going up there. We're going to worship God. Worshiping God is loving him and obeying him. Worship of God is not just when you get into the beat of a music. I'm worshiping God. Why? Because I just feel it. No, actually, you feel the beat. Abraham says, I love the Lord. I'm going to worship him. I'm going to go up and sacrifice my son. <clears throat> he tells his servants, 
Wait here. My son and I are going up there, and then we will come back to you. We will come back to you. You're going to kill your son, and then you and your son are coming back? How do dead people walk? What is he doing? You know what Abraham's doing? He is using logic in a sanctified way. Now, many Christians use logic, but in a very humanistic way. That's when you say, I'm going to do this with life. This makes sense. This expert said this. This expert said this. This professional said this. CNN said this. And I'm going to make this decision. Biblical logic says this. God says this. God says this. This expert may say this, this, and this. But first, we begin with the Bible. Take this truth here, this truth here from the Bible, and then we put it together like a puzzle. This is what Abraham's doing. God told him, your son, he's probably around 18, your son's going to die. He's not married yet, has no children. Your son one day will get married, have children, and through his lineage, the Messiah will come. Your son is not married, and today you're going to kill him. <clears throat> and Abraham's thinking, okay, he's going to die. But he has to get married. He has to have children. Dead people don't get married. Now, some people faint at their weddings, and they look dead. That's a different story. Isaac has to get married, to, but he's not. So this is what he does. God said to kill him, I'm going to kill him. God said he's going to live, he's going to have children, he's going to get married. Therefore, I conclude, based on the truth of the Bible, he will rise from the dead. This is Abraham's thinking. He's reasoning biblically. Man, is there a need for that. Use the Bible, not just, oh, you know, I got two verses about going to heaven and I don't need the Bible. No, you need the Bible. Like for everything. God has something to say about everything because he's sovereign. Abraham is thinking. He believes God. Verse 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father said, Here am I, son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Son says to dad, dad, we have the wood, we have the knife. Where's the offering? Where's the lamb? And Abraham says, God. God will provide, God will provide himself a lamb. God did provide literally himself. And the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, God provided himself a sacrifice. His name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning, being interpreted God with us. So they go up, and they came to the place, verse 9, which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar in there and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now remember, he's not four years old, he's a young man. His dad is an old man. An 18, 19, or 20 year old man can take out I mean, wrestle and beat his dad if his dad's 100. Right? And yet Isaac willingly lays down his life. If this is what God has demanded, then let it be. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For I now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. To fear God means to reverence him, to believe him, to love him. This trial reveals something about Abraham. It revealed this, that he had a real faith in the Lord. He really believed God. He didn't, it doesn't say... He believed because he understood. Well, Abraham didn't do this. <clears throat> God, you're telling me to sacrifice my son? That does not make sense. That is not healthy. It's not a healthy thing to kill your son. I don't think it's healthy. It's not wise. It's going to ruin my, my, career, my plans for his career. Therefore, because God doesn't make sense, I don't have to obey. No. No, if you understand God's command, you need to obey. Abraham's faith was put to the test in this time of suffering and it showed the strength of his faith, that his faith was real. Why is that important? Well, remember, the Apostle Paul would write in the book of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6, 
even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham? We are Abraham's children in this sense. Abraham had a real faith in the Lord. And God declared him righteous through faith in the Lord. So every person can be saved, whether Jew or Gentile, if they, like Abraham, believe and trust in the Lord. And that's what happened. Abraham believed God. His trial revealed where is Abraham's faith. It's in the Lord. It's in the Lord. God provides a substitute for Isaac. He removes Isaac from the altar. A lamb is caught in the thicket and they grab the ram and they put the ram in the place of Isaac. Why? Because one day, 2,000 years later, on that same mountain range, God would take his son and put him in our place. He would die a substitutionary death for sinners on the cross. And who will be saved? Those who, like Abraham, believe and trust in the Lord. I would like to say that everyone who says they have faith, when trials come, like Abraham, they believe God, yet that's not true, is it? When things are going well, I believe the Lord. you got to raise, praise the Lord. Turn up the Christian music, amen. When things go bad and you get a bad doctor's information from the doctor that illness has invaded your body. Real faith says with Job, though the Lord slay me, yet will I hope in him. This is the faith of Abraham. When suffering comes, it will test our faith whether it's real or not. Secondly, when suffering comes, sickness comes, trial comes, it should humble us. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to remind you that the Apostle Paul has had amazing experiences in his life. I'm not talking about the people who are not fully there mentally that are on YouTube making videos how they went to heaven and they went to hell, they went to Las Vegas. I'm talking about he had real experience with the risen Christ. When Paul got saved, how many people could say, the risen Christ came to me, knocked me off of my horse, knocked my wind out of me, and converted me in the dirt, and Jesus spoke, the risen Christ spoke to me. That's Paul's testimony. That's an awesome testimony. Jesus hunted him down. And saved him. This happened to Paul. But Paul's visit to heaven was probably his most extraordinary experience that he had. Like any believer, he could have become proud. He could have wrote books and says, I visited heaven. And for 1999, you can read my story. But he doesn't do that. Look at verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 12. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory, to brag. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Think about what Paul says. I saw heaven. God took me to heaven. He speaks in the third person to be humble. And I was there, and what I saw was so awesome, I don't even have, and by the way, he's a very educated man. I mean, Paul could freely quote the Old Testament freely quote pagan poets and philosophers by memory. Who does that? A very smart guy. And he says, when I went to heaven, I couldn't, I don't even have the words to describe the glory of heaven. And yet a five-year-old, an American five-year-old can do it? Verse 6. For though I would desire to glory... I shall not be a fool, 
For I will say the truth, and now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seemeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, to beat me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Think about it. Paul says, I, I had this revelation and many others. And I don't want to become proud. And in order for me to remain a humble servant of God, and that's what he was, in order for me to stay there as a useful, humble man who's experienced these supernatural experiences, for me to remain humble... God gave me a thorn in the flesh. The pictures of a, of a tent peg being driven into your body. That hurts. A splinter hurts. <laughs> How much more a tent peg? I have this thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. What is it referring to? Well, some believe it's some specific temptation of the devil. Some believe it is... Uh, Personal opposition from false teachers. False teachers being led of the devil to persecute Paul and Paul's suffering as these false teachers are spreading false doctrine. Others see it as some intense bodily pain, per, per, perhaps eye trouble, perhaps this malaria. Something is happening. Whatever the precise nature is, God doesn't tell us, but it's causing physical suffering in his body. Why did God allow his humble servant to get sick? To keep him humble. That way he wouldn't brag. I'm Paul. I've started churches. I've seen many people saved. I am wonderful. I am great. You, shouldn't. you should honor me. Name the church after me. St. Paul's Missionary Baptist Church. <laughs> he's not out to do that. He's, he's humble and God's going to keep him humble. Such troubles remind us when we get in a trouble like Paul and we're physically suffering in our body and we pray for God to remove it and God doesn't, right, doesn't do it right away. It should humble us. See, God doesn't use powerful people. He uses weak people. He uses people who are humble, who realize without the Lord, I'm nothing. We are without strength. We're to rest in His strength. Thus Paul says in verse 9, and he said unto me, after he prayed for, for, for deliverance from this illness, he said, and my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Now, are you crazy, Paul? I'm glad I was sick. Were you sick? I was sick. Man, I was glad. I was able to look at good food and say, I'm sick. I can't eat it. It's terrible. To see good, and then to eat food and not even taste it. Some food arrived at our home and Regina opened it and says, and put it there on the counter. And I just grabbed it, warmed up the microwave, and began to eat it. Regina looks at me and says, Did you smell that? I said, No. It has a lot of onions. And I just, I mean, really? I had lost all my taste and smell. So I thought it was celery. <laughs> and I'm just crunching away, lots of fresh onion in that soup. Just crunching away. I lost it. I couldn't even smell onion. To go through, to go through sickness and to say, I thank God for it. Oh, only a mentally ill person would say that. Paul said that. <laughs> he said that. Not that he was glad for the illness. But he was glad for what God was doing in his life. That God at times will allow illness and sickness and trial to come to humble us. If we always had perfect health, we think we're somebody. Well, what's the secret? Well, you see, I have secret vitamins that I take. I exercise, and that's why you see this physique. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to brag too much. And man, we begin. We get big-headed. Right? I, I, I'm just. Man, I'm just. Whew, I'm just a healthy guy. I'm. Just, I'm somebody. But when sickness comes, God says, remember, you're nobody. Without him, you're weak. You can't save yourself. You can't preserve yourself. Human life is fragile. 
Our life, the Bible says, is but a vapor. It's here today, then it's gone. And illness reminds us without the Lord, we have no strength. God is not attracted to our boasting, but to our humble brokenness. We realize without the Lord, we are nothing. Now, we've got five other points, but I don't think I'm going to get to them all. But let me say simply this. Every time sickness comes, let us remember, number one, God didn't promise you health and wealth in this world. Number two, it's a blessing when we recover from illness. Not just that our health returns to our body, not just that you can smell onions and be warned of them. Well, that's a blessing. Not just that you can begin to taste food, that's a blessing. We no longer have a high fever and chills and feel sick to our stomach. When those symptoms are relieved, we ought to thank God for that. But listen, there's something to learn there. You experience illness, God brought you out. Your life on this earth is short. Life on earth is short. Eternity is long. And only two things are eternal. The Bible and the souls of men. The gospel humbles us, doesn't it? In the gospel, it's not, there's good news. You and God together can save yourself. No, the good news is that you can't save yourself. We are sinners under the wrath of God. Every heartbeat that we have is a gift of God, and one day, one day, one day our heart will stop, and we will enter into eternity. And the only acceptance that God accepts is perfect righteousness. And God has given that in His Son. It is Christ who has lived this sinless, perfect life in obedience to the Father. He alone went to the cross of Calvary to bear the sins of many, to take upon him the wrath of God, to conquer death the third day through his resurrection. And he didn't stop there. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the ultimate governmental official today. Even though no one voted him in, he didn't ask for your vote. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And he will save you from the great enemy of death. He'll save you from your sin and from God's wrath if you'll humble yourself and come in repentance and faith and trust in Him. When we go through an illness and we come out, we ought to thank God for that and realize my life is short. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added. Are you living for eternity? Or are you living for time? Is your mind shaped by the Word of God or by the, soul, by, the, by the narrative put out by the media? Are we being conformed to this world? Or are we being transformed by the renewing of your mind? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the lessons you teach us in times of sickness and suffering. Father, we know that trials reveal the strength of our faith. And many times our, our faith is weak. But you tell us in your word that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. May we be under the teaching of your word that you would increase our faith, strengthen our faith, that our faith would not be in self, in our own wisdom, but that our faith and our trust would be in Christ, him crucified and risen from the dead for us. Father, when sickness and suffering comes, as it did in the life of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, may we be humbled. Humble believers, Father, humbled believers are forgiving believers. Who are we to hold offenses against anybody when we have offended you and you've forgiven us for Christ's sake? Humble believers, Father. Humble believers love you and love others. We have no room for pride or boasting. Grant your people here at Emmanuel Baptist Church a spirit of humility, of teachableness, that we would not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Help us that we would walk humbly before you in dependence upon Christ daily, and that in humility we would receive your word in meekness, in meekness that we would receive the engrafted word which is able to save our soul. 
Strengthen your people, Lord. Humble us. Help us to walk faithfully with you. Bless the truth of the gospel. Save sinners. Be glorified through the teaching of your word this morning. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, take a couple of moments to pray. And let's examine our own hearts, our own ideas, our own thoughts before the Lord. And ask the Lord, Lord, what do you have for me to learn this morning? Be humble to receive his truth this morning. Let's pray. Let's talk to the Lord, and then we'll close in a word of prayer together in a few moments. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your patience and long-suffering to us. Lord, may we grow in our faith. May we grow in humility. May our confidence grow not in self, but in you. Bless the teaching of your word to the life of every individual here this morning, to the life of your church. May we grow in grace. May we grow in graciousness to others. We pray. And ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, Don't forget at 2.